This is the next sermon in, in the series, sermon number 11 by James Rennick on Zechariah 2, verse 8. It's from a choice collection of sermons on page 132. Prior to the sermon proper, he has a preface that I will read that he spoke to the people before the sermon. The Lord hath been bringing a great trial in Galloway's way. I would ask one necessary question at you, whether or not do you find yourselves getting any good of this as yet. Believe me, you look like a people sold under judgments rather than chased into the Lord by judgments. But, my friends, if you be getting good of this trial, I will tell you what you will find wrought in you by the Lord's blessing. First you will find this wrought in you that is a more serious frame and sincere study in religion, seeking after God. You will find religion more seriously to be your concernment. A man or woman that is getting good of the trial will be getting more concernedness with religion. You will find that that uh, made more your work. And you will find more seriousness about it. This is one of the Lord's special purposes of bringing this trial upon you. And how great and noble an advantage do you reap if this shall be gained. My friends, would you get good of this trial? Then be stirred up to make sure work with himself. Be stirred up by it to make religion your main work and to flee into himself. Be stirred up to prize Christ the more than that which he hath purchased for sinners. Second, if you be getting good of this trial, I will tell you what you will find wrought in your souls by his blessing. You will find a more deep sense of the vanity and hatefulness of sin. The Lord is writing over and upon all the sinful courses of the time, vanity. And oh, that the vanity of them were a light to let you see the sinfulness of them. He is making many to see this, even that their compliance with sinful courses will not save nor help them. He lets them see complying courses to be vain and hateful courses. Oh, all all ye that would have good of this trial, be instructed to look back upon your sinful ways and upon sin as it hath provoked the Lord so to deal with you. Oh, look upon sin in its own color as it is vain and a hateful thing. Oh, how bitter and evil a thing it is to depart from the living God. Oh, how hateful a thing it is to depart from him, to sin against him, who is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity without indignation. Believe me, I will tell you one thing, that that man and woman that looks not on sin as God looks on it, that is with hatred and detestation, they shall be looked on by God as he looks on sin. That is, God will look upon you with hatred and abhorrency, if ye look not upon sin with the greatest of abhorrency. And third, if you be getting good of this trial, then you will find it working in you an acceptance of the punishment of your iniquities, and you will be justifying God in bringing it upon you. But know that an acceptance of the punishment of your iniquity is given by the Holy Ghost as an evidence of fittedness and preparedness for mercies. For when they accept of the punishment of their iniquities and are humbled for their uncircumcisedness of heart, then he will return and have mercy and remember his covenant with Jacob. O accept of the punishment of your sins and take it as out of God's hand. Do not look upon the trial as a thing coming upon you by chance and coming only from men. Take it as coming from the Lord. Take it as the punishment of your sins and as his reproof, for indeed it is most just on your part as coming from him. And as to his part it justifies him who doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. O then accept of it as the punishment of your iniquity, and beware of quarreling at God's hand, for this trial is to know who will accept of it and who not. Behold, his soul that is lifted up is not upright in him, saith Habakkuk, but the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 
And I will tell you one thing, if you be not helped by grace to accept of it as the punishment of your iniquity, you will soon run into iniquity and into some sinful course and to add iniquity to sin, which is explained by the apostle and called murmuring and quarreling or drawing back, Hebrews 10.28. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. For let me see a man or woman quarreling at God God's punishing of them for their iniquities this day, and I will let you see a man or a woman who will turn their back upon Christ the next day. And fourth, if you be getting any good of this trial, you will find in yourselves a patient submission of spirit, both as to God's present chastisement and also to what he may do in time to come. Even so, the prophet Micah holds out the church her reaping good of her affliction when she is brought to this with it. Micah 7, 9, I will hear, the, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. O be patient under the Lord's hand and submissive to what he sees fit to carve out in your lot. You must be at submission of spirit as to what he may hereafter do if you would get good of this trial. You must be submissive to his measuring out of your lot as he pleases. He must not set bounds to the unlimited Holy One of Israel. So the church, when humbled under his hand, says, In Micah 7, 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord, because I have sinned against him, until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. That is, I will bear what measure of chastisement the Lord shall be pleased to set forth. I will bear it, I, till he be pleased to remove it. I will set no term day or bounds unto him. You that are seeking and are earnestly desiring the Lord's appearing, for breaking the yoke of the enemies and removing the blasphemies of the wicked, you must be thus exercised. You must submit to his chastisements as long as he sees fit to lay them on you. Now these things you shall find wrought in you, if so be you get good of this present short trial. Many other evidences may be given, but I shall name but another and leave you at present with it. Fifth, if you be getting good by God's afflicting you, you will find this wrought in you, even much humility of spirit. For when the Lord chastens his people, he seeks especially to have them a humble people. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he shall lift you up in due time. I say you will find humility wrought in you, if if so be you getting good of this trial. Proud conceited folk under the rod declare by their practice that they get no good by the rod. How long shall the Lord chasten you, and yet your, your pride remain with you? Oh, then humble yourselves under his hand, for the want of this humility draws many strokes out of his hand. Humble yourselves under God's hand then, and lie in the dust if you would get good of trials. And to him only, who can bless this present trial unto you, let us pray. Now the sermon, Zechariah 2, verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Time and your patience will not allow me to repeat what at former occasion hath been said on these words, albeit because some of you have not been present to hear what was delivered at the same, I shall briefly deduce, resume, or rehearse what hath been said from the connection and and division of the words. As for the connection, there is here represented to the prophet Zechariah, a man with a measuring line in his hand, going to measure Jerusalem to see what was the breadth thereof and the length thereof, and this man here with the measuring line in his hand is Christ, appearing to the prophet in the, in the similitude of his human nature. And he hath a measuring line in his hand to signify that he was exercised or taken up about his church, and then he only can set bounds and prescribe limits unto his church. And he is taken up about her building. The measuring line saith that he hath the borders of his church in his own hand, and, they, and that he is the master builder. Now when the prophet sees that there is presently information given him what Christ's purpose is in showing him this vision, 
that is, that Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, and his purpose was to enlarge the borders of his church, for by Jerusalem is signified and typified the church, and that she shall be inhabited with great multitudes of people, like people dwelling without the body of a, of a city. And Christ here prescribeth the bounds of the church. And believe me, whatever bounds Christ prescribeth to his church, I defy all the powers in heaven or in earth to retract it. Let kings and powers of great men set their shoulders to it and mount all their forces, they shall not retract it. Ho, ho, says he, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as a town without walls, and that whether they will or not. But to make up the church's happy condition, there seems to be something wanting. Where shall our safety then be, might the church say, if Jerusalem be inhabited without walls? But to obviate this, their doubt, it, it is told them that he will be the glory in the midst of them, and a wall of fire round about them. The expression seems to be taken from the pillar of fire that went before the children of Israel, or from the Lord's guarding Elijah in Dothan with chariots of fire. Howbeit, it holds out this, that the enemies of God's church run themselves into as hazardous courses as if man should throw himself into a burning fire. Now this is the vision, and the Lord applies it to three sorts of folk. First he applies it to the Jews who lay by from the work of the temple and stayed still at Babylon. And he uses it, useth it as an exhortation to invite them home. And here he represents to the people his vision that he is about his work to build his temple. And that was to encourage the Jews who stayed at Babylon to come and join with their brethren at Jerusalem. Here you have three reasons to enforce this encouragement in the words the first two are the fifth and seventh verses, and the other is in the words read. The first reason, because they had been scattered abroad in God's anger, and their being in that condition was an evidence of his displeasure. Therefore, they should not have stayed in that condition, wherein God's wrath is declared against them. The second reason is couched up in the seventh verse, that since they had the name of Zion and were professors, it was very unseemly for them to remain dwelling at Babylon. Deliver thyself, O Zion, etc. It was a shame to Zion to dwell at Babylon when they might be at Jerusalem. As if he had said, it is a shame for professors to dwell at Babylon. The very name of Zion or of professors should shame you out of Babylon. The third reason is in the words of the text, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations that spoiled you. He was about to bring judgments on the nations that spoiled them, even upon Babylon. And therefore it was not safe for them to be in Babylon. For they that are in the enemy's camps, when he punishes enemies, shall drink of the enemy's cup. After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations that spoiled you. And therefore flee, O daughter of Zion, out of Babylon, if you would, if thou would not uh, taste of Babylon's cup. Now, for the better understanding of these words, they were divided into these five particulars. First, that Christ is the fit interpreter of the Father's will, for it is he who saith, thus saith the Lord of hosts. And second, that Christ is sent to see the Father's will executed or done. I am sent to them that spoiled you. Third, the time was, the time when he was sent, that is after the glory, which is to be understood thus, after that God had visited his people with afflictions, Christ is sent to pour down afflictions on the nations that had been the instruments of their afflictions and calamities. Or it is on this way understood that after the Lord hath begun to manifest his glory in their begun re restoration, he sent me to the nations that they may not impede or hinder the work. Four, the cause which is because they had spoiled his people. Five, the reason and motive which is drawn from his own sympathy with them. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. That is, they that hurt the members of Christ's mystical body touch his eye, which is the most tender part of the body. 
Now, as to the first two particulars, they were a little spoken to unto, and so we proceed to the third, which is the time, after the glory, etc. From whence this doctrine was laid down, doctrine one, that the church is called Christ's glory. And that was shown in, a, in six or seven respects, and it was applied by a word of use. And now I proceed to a second doctrine from the same head. Doctrine two. As the Lord in his procedure doth afflict and punish his church before he punish his adversaries, so the afflictions of his people are forerunners and pledges of his enemies' ruin. After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations that spoiled you. That is, after he hath visited his people, which is his glory, with afflictions, now, says he, I am sent to the nations that spoiled his people. The second doctrine hath two members, the first whereof is this, that the Lord, in the way of his procedure, punisheth his people before he punishes his enemies. And you may see, for confirmation of this, what the Apostle saith in 1 Peter 4.17. For the time has come, that judgment must begin at the house of God. So you see, the Lord, in his ordinary procedure, first gives the cup into the hands of his people before he yoke with enemies. And so he hath begun to punish his people in this land before he punish malignants. My friends, uh, would you have some reasons why the Lord doth this way proceed to punish his people before he punishes their enemies? For answer, take these. First reason is that the people of God may win the more easily through. For the cup of God's displeasure hath always the dregs at the bottom of it, which is put into enemies' hands. Psalm 75, 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Because I say he will have his people to pass easily through. Therefore he giveth them the brim, or the beginning of the cup. He giveth them the first of the cup, but to the enemies he giveth the dregs in the bottom of it. His people get an easy pull of it in, ref- in respect to what they have, who get, the, who get the dregs thereof put into their hands. Oh, his enemy's cup is a cup of pure wrath, but his people's cup is a cup of no wrath, but of comfort and consolation. But the, wicked, uh, but the wicked's cup is a cup of pure wrath, for the dregs of the wrath of God is a very sad cup. Second reason why he punishes his people before he punishes enemies is because he will have the enemies be the the more inexcusable, because they took not warning at his people's rods and afflictions. Obadiah verse 16, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Jeremiah 25:29 For lo I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name and shall ye be utterly unpunished ye shall not be unpunished for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth saith the Lord of hosts So when the Lord bringeth evil upon the city which is called by his name and when he punisheth his people he hereby declares his hatred against sin and thereby warns the enemies of their danger, for since he punisheth the city and the people that are called by his name, much more will he punish them. They shall not be unpunished. He will call for a sword against them. So he punishes his own people first, that he may get his enemies rendered inexcusable by their not taking warning to leave their ungodly ways when they see the afflictions of the Lord's people for their sin coming from him. Third reason why he punishes his people first before he punishes enemies is because enemies are made use of as the instruments of his people's affliction. In Isaiah 10, 5 and 6, O Assyria, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the, like the mire of the streets. And so you see, the Lord makes his enemies a rod in his hand against his own people. And therefore, he must first make use of it on them before he break and burn it. 
as to the second member of the doctrine, that is, that the afflictions of the Lord's people are forerunners of judgment on his enemies and the rest of the world. Remember these four-sided places, 1 Peter 4.17 and 18, Obadiah verse 16, Jeremiah 25.29. I, all your afflictions and judgments, I say, are pledges of his pouring down his wrath upon his enemies. For so long as ye have the rod on your backs, ye want not pledges and confirmations of this truth, that God will be about with his enemies. But I shall give you some reasons to prove this point that the Lord's punishing of his people is a pledge and forerunner of sad judgments coming upon his enemies and the rest of the world. First reason, because hereby, thereby he declares his hatred against sin. And since he declares his hatred against sin and punishing it in his own people, how much more hatred and abhorrence hath he added it, added in his enemies? The sins of adversaries are sins of a gross die. They are gross wickedness. Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Hereby the prophet is holding out that the Lord is of purer eyes than that he can behold sin because of his holiness, but with hatred and detestation, though in his own people. And therefore, how much more hatred bears he against the sins of his enemies? So then what he doth to his people is a forerunner or declaration of what is coming on his enemies. For since God thereby declares that he hates your sin, it is a pledge that he will punish enemies because of their gross abominations. The second reason is this, because by these chastisements of his people for their sins, he declared, he declares his anger against sin. There is anger imported in these reiterated expressions, Obadiah verse 16, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. These hold forth how angry the Lord is at them because of sin. And hereby he declares his anger against his people's sin by making them drink the cup of affliction at his hand. Yea, how doth that, I say, proclaim the greatness of his wrath and anger against the sins of the heathens? His people did drink the brim, but it is said of them, they shall swallow down and be as though they had not been. They shall drink till they be consumed. I say you may read by your afflictions God's anger against your sins. And this you may read as a proclamation of his anger against the wicked courses of the heathen. So his anger is manifested by the chastisements that befall you and is a forerunner of his cruel wrath that will break forth by sad judgments on his enemies and the rest of the world. Third reason is because that since he afflicts his own people for their sins, notwithstanding of their interest they have in him and his love toward them, how much more then will he punish the wicked of the world who have no interest in him and who have no special part of love in him? This is clear from Jeremiah 25:29. There the Lord reasons thus, since he had punished the people called by his own name and the city that had interest in him and to whom he had borne kindness beyond others. Therefore he assures his enemies that they should not go unpunished. So I say when he punishes the people who have part in his special love, that is a pledge that he will grievously plague adversaries that have no such interest in him. So then since he punisheth you, who are his people. Take that as a declaration of his anger and judgments which he will bring upon his adversaries and them that are not his people. Fourth reason is because his perfect holy eye of providence is over his people to take notice of their ways that he may take notice of them. So his perfect holy eye of providence is over his enemies that he may take notice of sin in them and punish them accordingly. And so as he punisheth his people, undoubtedly he will not pass his enemies unpunished. This is clear from Zechariah 9.1. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, when the eyes of men, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord, and Hamath also shall border thereby, Tyrus and Sidon, though it be very wise. 
This is meant of enemies. The Lord had a burden, that is, sad judgments, to bring on the land of Assyria, called Hadrach from one of its idols. And Damascus, the chief city thereof, should drink deepest in the cup. The burden should lie chiefly there. And remember this, by the way, that the the chief cities of the land shall be the chief seats of God's judgments. Why was it that God brought this burden upon Assyria? But because the Lord seeth all men, as some read it, to punish them according to their ways. The words may also be understood thus, when the Lord's people have their eyes towards him for their help, then he will bring judgments out upon his enemies. Yet some read the words thus without tortoring one another, that when the Lord is the eyes of man in all the tribes of Israel, then the eyes of all Israel shall be toward the Lord, showing this, that the Lord by his eye of providence observeth all nations as well as his own people and will also punish them, which he is declaring by his punishing his own people for their sins. And therefore, since he observes enemies' sins as well as his own people's sins, he will not leave enemies' sins unpunished. The Lord hath been observing your ways and backslidings and back drawings and is punishing you for them. He is also observing enemies' blasphemies and wickedness. And as he punisheth you for your sins, so he will punish them for their sins and iniquities. And the dregs of the cup of the wrath of God is to be put into their hands. For the afflictions of the people of God are not only forerunners of sad judgments on adversaries, but also of insupportable judgments coming upon them. It is easier to bear what God lays on you than to bear what he lays upon enemies' backs. The fifth reason, because enemies help forward the affliction of his people. Therefore he declares that their afflictions are forerunners of enemies' judgments. Zechariah 1.15 And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore he is very sore displeased with them. So the afflictions which enemies carry on declare that there are sad judgments abiding them, because he is very sore displeased with the heathen for helping forward the affliction of his people. For when God intends by them to punish his people, then they purpose a far other thing than God intends, even his people's ruin. Isaiah 10, 6 and 7, I will send him against an hypocritical nation to take the spoil. Howbeit he meaneth not so, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations not a few. I say when the Lord doth correct, afflict and chasten you by enemies, they are helping on their own calamity by going beyond all bounds, proposing your overthrow and destruction. I say hereby they declare themselves to be in such a a case that your afflictions are pledges and forerunners of their own sad judgments. For it is in this case as if a father would be angry with a son and for his fault should correct him. And a slave in the house, seeing that, should begin to run upon him and kill him. What think ye, would he not soon forget his son's fault and turn his hand upon the slave? Even so it is with enemies. When God punishes his people, enemies, as so many slaves, run upon them to slay them. Therefore he will turn his hand upon these slaves and cut them off. These things may confirm us in this, that God's dealing with his people by way of afflicting them is a certain pledge of the destruction of adversaries. For as God is faithful in punishing your sins, so he will declare himself to be just in bringing heavy wrath upon them. Let me uh, lay this home upon you by sundry uses. Use number one. From the first uh, member of the doctrine, learn to accept of and be exhorted to receive your punishment and affliction at God's hand with great cheerfulness and take it as a token of his kindness toward you. He hath given you the brim of the cup. My friends, the greatest storm that you have, you have moderation with it, in respect of what comes on enemies. And ye have your your storm first, for the first blast is easiest. Your affliction hath moderation, but that which comes upon his enemies hath none. When he comes to seek and find his enemies out, though they should climb to the top of Carmel or hide themselves in the bottom of the sea, yet there his hand will find them out. 
His people get a hole to hide themselves from enemies. But when God comes against enemies, they shall get no place to hide them in. Yea, if God were come to the fields to contend against enemies, I do not think that mosses, woods, mirrors, or crags shall be hiding places for them. I mean malignants. Therefore receive your chastisements with cheerfulness off his hands. I say take it with cheerfulness that he hath begun at you first. Use number two. From this member of the doctrine, that is that God punishes his people before his enemies, let me reprove you who refuse to suffer affliction with his people. Ye who refuse and reject his cause, ye shall drink deep in the cup of his enemies. For believe me, they who will not suffer with his people shall suffer with enemies. But when he comes to plead his cause against them, oh, but compliers, be great fools. They think by compliance to free themselves of suffering, but they shall involve themselves into inevitable sufferings. Those who go about and refuse to suffer affliction with the people of, the, of God shall suffer affliction with his enemies. Psalm 9:16. The Lord is known by the judgment with the, which he executeth. The complying of compliers shall ensnare them into inevitable snares. The day is coming when neither kirk nor court, test nor gear shall save them. You will make use of enemies to punish compliers. And then folly and vanity may be written upon them and their compliance. Yea, when enemies fall, ye shall fall who comply with them. When God throws down enemies, then compliers with enemies who have upholden them shall also fall down with them. When God levels his shots at the wicked throne of Britain, then shall all who are covered with the shadow of it be crushed with the ruins of it. And so I say this trial of his love, thereby he is seeking to chase some of you out of enemies' camps who have had very little, uh, very little will to part with them in their camps. There is some who, if they could have escaped so, they would have would not have parted with them. They would have been content to have paid the cess in the locality. They might have bidden in their houses. Yet it shall not be so, for if God have a love unto you, he will not leave you so. That family that he hath not a mind to destroy with adversaries, he will bring them forth. I say these that he minds not to destroy with the enemies. He will bring suffering to their doors. Therefore refuse not suffering affliction with the people of God. For believe me, if you have run from them and continue so to do, the judgments of God that he sends upon his enemies will overtake you. Well then see what you will choose, whether you will take part with his people to drink uh, the cup of his father's fatherly displeasure and chastisements? Or will you take part with enemies and drink the cup of his unmixed wrath and judgments? Moses rather choose to suffer afflictions with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Use number three from the second member of the doctrine, that is that the punishments of the people of God are forerunners of sad judgments upon enemies and the rest of the words. Learn this use of instruction. Be assured, enemies shall not be unpunished. For, their, for your punishments are proof and, and prognostics of sad judgments coming upon them. Jeremiah 25:29. It was a sad token for malignants when God began to chasten his people for their sin. They may therefore be assured that he will punish them. Ye have his promise for it, even for the confirmation of this. Yea, their strength, wisdom, nor riches shall not save them. For the Lord is he that, that is most powerful and faithful, and therefore he will be about with them. He is a faithful God in executing what he had threatened upon his people for their sins, and therefore he will be faithful in executing judgments upon his enemies for their sins. I proceed to the third doctrine from this particular. After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations that spoiled you. I told you that it might be understood two ways. Thus, uh, first, uh, that in the Lord's visiting his people with affliction, that then he would turn his hand against his enemies. From this I have drawn two doctrines. Doctrine one, that the people of God are his glory. Doctrine two, as he punishes his people before his enemies, so their chastisements and afflictions are forerunners of sad judgments upon the enemies. 
And so from the other sense of the words, that is, after that he had begun to manifest his glory, and there begun restoration, he will punish his enemies, that they may not mar the carrying on of his glory. And from this sense I lay down this doctrine, doctrine three, that when the Lord begins to manifest his glory to his people, either in the time of storms or after storms in their low case, it is a pledge or token that he will carry on his glory and that he will not suffer the carrying on of it to be hindered. For proof of this, see Deuteronomy 22.4. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment and a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Psalm 111.6. He hath showed his people the power of his works that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. So after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations of spoiled you. Yea, notwithstanding that they were spoiled, they were his glory, for all that their affliction did to obstruct their being that in his sight, yet they were his glory, and precious in his sight. Notwithstanding of all their afflictions, yet they are his declarative glory, for their interest stands in him, and his love is towards them. And his care of them continues, as no chastisement can break off his interest between God and his people. So God's love to and care of his people stands, they continue to be his glory, notwithstanding of affliction. But for application of this point to our own case, I would tell you some ways of God's manifesting his glory amongst us in our low case, whereby we may be confirmed in this that he will carry on his work, notwithstanding of all opposition. First, he is manifesting his glory by truths getting many deliverances. Yea, even in these times when we fell, truth met with these deliverances. As the Lord, by our fall at Bothwell, brought more clearness and vindication to the truth than our standing would have done. Yea, I will tell you, truth is meeting with a deliverance amongst you by this present trial. Many a man lippened to the paying of the cess as a ground to keep them in their houses who yet notwithstanding of that they shall be cast in out of their houses, that God may write over that course folly and vanity. And now the truth is meeting with a deliverance. Take it as a manifestation of his glory, as a token that he will carry on his glory, hinder who will, and that he will remove impediments out of the way. And second, he manifests his glory by continuing a witnessing remnant in the land. Notwithstanding of all the backslidings therein, yet he hath a witnessing remnant in this land. Yea, there is not a, a step of our defections, but the, our Lord hath had a small remnant to witness for him against the same. And he hath a remnant this day to witness against all defections and compliances. And so by this we may see him manifesting his glory. And it is a token that he will carry on his work and will remove away whatever obstructs the same. And third, he manifests his glory by accepting of sacrifices at the hands of that remnant. Yea, he hath accepted of protestations at their hands when they could not get sin hindered. Yea, he hath accepted of declarations and testimonies on the fields in cities and seas for his cause and truth. So that we may say on the matter that as Manoah's wife said unto him, being afraid of the angel, if the Lord had a mind to destroy us, he would not have accepted a meat offering and a drink offering at our hands. So I say, if the Lord minded to destroy us, he would not have accepted such sacrifices at our hands. So then the Lord is, has not a mind to destroy, but will carry on his work in glory, and will remove all obstructions out of the way. Had he not accepted such testimonies, declarations, and protestations at your hands, where had we been long ere now? And thus he, in our low case, manifests his glory. Take it then as a pledge of his carrying on his work in glory, that he will remove all obstructions out of the way, and that he will not give over carrying on his work in glory till he perfected. He is busy building his church, and though his building be, as it were, underground, yet because he is building, he thereby declares that he will not give it over till he get it unto the end with shouting and acclamations of joy and crying grace unto it. 
For if he manifests his glory by his owning and countenancing his remnant in their sufferings, he hath made them to declare at the day of their extreme or greatest sufferings that the, that day was the most joyful day that ever they had. Even when going to the scaffolds to lay down their lives for him, they have been made to go singing and rejoicing, declaring that then they would not change their lots for many kingdoms. Yea, how many of them have been made to appear like the children of kings, and how he hath filled their mouths with songs of praise, and making them say that the lines were fallen unto them in pleasant places, when that he was with them in the fire and in the water. And so he manifests his glory by giving his remnant cheerfulness of mind to endure sufferings for him. And so he sets out his kindness in this day of trial unto you, when he lifts up the light of his countenance upon you, and so ye may take this as a pledge of his carrying on his work and glory. Five, he manifests his glory among us by his leading and feeding the remnant in their low case so that in some case it may be said that there was not more of God seen in leading the Israelites through the wilderness by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night than there is in his leading of his poor remnant this day by his careful eye of providence upon us and about us. For we have rocks on the right hand and rocks on the left hand, parties on the right hand and parties on the left hand, and yet he hath led a remnant through all these in the good old way. And hath he not manifested more of his attributes in feeding and leading his people now than to Israel of old, as spiritual onlookers do behold? Sixth, he manifests his glory in plucking his people as praise out of the enemy's teeth sometimes, and relieves and delivers out of prison houses sometimes, and sometimes he pulls them out of the hands of soldiers and sometimes delivers them when they were, uh, when they are pursuing them and hides them under his wings. Think ye that if the Lord's special providence were not in all this, that so many hunters would soon hunt us all out? And seven, he manifests his glory amongst us in our low case by increasing the number of the remnant in many corners of the land, notwithstanding of all the cruelties and oppositions by enemies. So is it not to be said that of some places of the land to the praise of his name be it spoken. The more they were oppressed, the more they grew. So that it is our wonder, considering how many have been taken away by death, banishment, and otherwise, that yet they are not missed. The Lord hath not been wanting to keep up the number. Yea, to increase the number, so that if you shall pass, pass through some corners of the land, this shall be sounded in your ears, seeing I have lost my children. Who hath begotten me all these? Oh, that it might be so with poor Galloway, that this great oppression might make them grow. I hope it shall bring some of you more from the enemy's camps. Or let it make none of you fall more into enemy's camps. I say take all these as manifestations of his glory and pledges that he will carry on his work and perfect it, notwithstanding of what may obstruct it. Let me lay this home upon you by a word of use for consolation. Be comforted then. But since God is so many ways carrying on his glory, therefore be comforted in this that God will carry it on to the end. Enemies shall not be able to hinder it. Therefore encourage yourselves in this. And in his name and strength proclaim a defiance to all that enemies can do or what created powers can do. And tell them that ye have pledges that he will carry on his work amongst you. Proclaim this to the bloody tyrant, and to the bloody council, and to the bloody soldiers, and let us say, We defy you, for we have the Lord amongst us. O all ye saints, praise ye him. Amen. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www. 
swrb dot com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb dot com, by phone at seven eight zero four five zero thirty seven thirty, by fax at seven eight zero four six eight ten ninety six, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God, for when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important, when he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.